getting more speed and distance on your putt is a lot easier than you think. All it takes is this one little adjustment. Hey everybody, what is up? It's Antonio. Welcome to episode 16 of Teach Play Disc Golf, a Gladiator Disc Golf podcast. I'm so excited to have you today. I have a great show planned for you and I cannot wait to get to it. We have some really fun things to talk about. So for today's show, we're going to, as I alluded to already, talk about a really important and helpful putting skill. After that, we are going to review the Prodigy Disc 400 Reverb with the KJ USA uh, Slip Ace stamp on it. Pretty cool disc. We'll talk a little bit about that and my thoughts on it. Uh, unless I'm missing something, and I, and I very well could be, but as I was compiling my notes, I couldn't think of anything. But I couldn't think of anything really noteworthy that happened in the world of disc golf outside of tournaments. So we don't really have a whole lot of current events at all to talk about this week, but that's okay because I have some thoughts about the Zoo Town Open, and then we're going to prep for DDO this upcoming weekend. So that's what we got on the show tonight or today or this afternoon, depending when you're listening or watching. So let's go ahead and let's get right into it. The tip that I want to talk to you guys about today for your putting is, is very simple in theory and honestly pretty simple in practice, but it's going to feel a little awkward at first. And that's when you're putting, whether you're push putting or spin putting, but especially if you're a spin putter or a spush putter, you want to use your fingers and your wrists a lot more. Now, there is some uh, validity to this tactic for push putting, not so much with the wrist, but with the fingers. And so if you are a push putter, I still encourage you to listen to this tip because I think it can help you. You may just have to make a few little adjustments that a spin putter or a spush putter may not have to make. So basically what we're talking about here is something that Calvin Heinberg discusses, and that's using your fingers to basically uh, work on propelling the disc out of your hand. So for those of you that are watching, you're gonna kind of get a uh, little bit of a uh, visual uh, course here, while those who are listening are, are going to have to kind of just visualize this in your head. But take your putting grip, and something that Calvin talks about actually in an Innova video that I saw recently, I had this thought, because it's something I was working on, and then I saw this video, I'm like, sweet, this is, so this is not anything like, new, we can talk about this, people are talking about this, so I wanted to share it here. But something that Calvin shares in that video is, while you're sitting and you take your, and you have your putter, whether you're on the couch or whatever, or you're in the passenger seat, don't do this while driving. You know, just kind of pop the disc up, and what you want to do is just use your fingers and your wrist to just kind of pop it straight into the air and catch it. and when you're using just your fingers and your wrist there, you're basically going to create that strength and that pop that you need for your putt. And so what's going to happen is you wanna keep everything the same when you are just doing your normal putt, but especially for putts where you have a low ceiling or it's a pretty far distance and you need a little bit extra pace on the putter, it really helps to pop with your fingers and your wrists. Now we do not want to completely lose form here, especially with our wrists and, and uh, open or overextend our wrists. We, we like to keep our wrists kind of locked onto the basket when we finish our putt. And so you don't want your wrist to be popping super far right or left, depending if you're righty or lefty putter, because chances are the disc is going to be following that trajectory. But if you, as you work on this, popping that wrist right at the basket and doing it with some force, and but really putting the emphasis in your fingers, getting your fingers to do some pushing, is really going to help get that spin and that speed behind the disc. Now, this all sounds really good in theory, but it's going to take a little bit of time as you work to work on this. Um, I've been working on it now for probably about a month, month and a half. I've just been messing around with it. I don't have to do it on every putt. Like that's the other thing. You don't wanna do this on every putt. Like if you have a 
eight foot, 12 foot putt, you don't want to just be popping it at the basket. Um, Cause it's not going to kind of, it's really not going to help you there. You want to really like, it might become more familiar feeling and that's a good time to practice it, but you really don't need it for something that close. A lot of times I'll really think about popping my fingers on a deep C1 putt or C2 and beyond. And this past week or this past weekend, I should say, I actually had two circle two putts that I made out of maybe only three or four C2 attempts. So I made about 50 or 66% of my putts with this method because I was able to just, I didn't have to change the height a ton on my putt, but I got more pace behind it. And that really helped the disc travel to the basket on the line that I wanted it without having to do any kind of crazy angle change. And so I have found this putt personally, this, this additional, um, aspect to longer putts and low ceiling putts to work really well. And the reason I mention low ceiling is because there are times where you don't obviously have the space, the ceiling to get air under the disc and really give it some more loft or height rather, I should say, but you can give it speed. And if you can really pop your fingers when you put the disc, you aren't going to have to really fling your shoulder, which can cause some uncomfort, uh, discomfort, and some pain. Uh, but yeah, I want to encourage you to try popping with your fingers, your wrist is going to kind of follow suit. The big thing about this is you need to remember to stay loose. If you're super tense, when you're trying to do this, it's not going to work as well. So stay loose like you should in your putting form and really work on popping those fingers. I want to recommend Calvin's drill about like when you're sitting, just kind of popping the disc up in the air. And over time, you should be seeing that you're getting the disc higher more consistently. And the higher that the disc gets as you pop it straight up into the air, the better it's going to be now, or the, the better that you're getting at this. And when you're popping it straight into the air, I want to just make sure, um, for those of you who are listening, like you want the disc to be vertically going up. So basically the nose of the disc is facing the ceiling. Okay, I don't want you to try and pop this and have the flight plate facing the ceiling because that would just be super awkward. You want the nose of the disc, the round edge, the blunt edge to be facing the ceiling as you pop it up because that's how your hand's going to be facing the basket when you go in there. So I just wanted to clarify that. Sorry if that didn't make any sense, but I hope it did in case you were wondering, okay, how, which way is the disc facing? But that is the disc golf skill, a super quick little thing, but I think it's going to help a lot of people out there, especially if you've been struggling with some of your deeper putts. And as I mentioned earlier, with the push putters, all you'll have to do is kind of, as you lift that disc up, kind of give it a little bit of a pop with your fingers up into the air. Your pop's going to be a little bit different. This is definitely a skill more targeted towards spin and push putters, but I do think that some push putters can make adjustments to, uh, to their form to help kind of with a more finger pop putt. But I hope you guys found that super helpful. If you're still a little confused about this, you can go ahead and comment down below. I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. And also, if you want to send me a video and be like, hey, am I doing this right? You can send me a video on GiveGo and I can coach you and help you out with that. Now, let's go ahead and let's talk about our disc, the Prodigy Disc Reverb or Reverb. It's a music term. It's one of uh, Kevin Jones's uh, discs in his lineup when he renewed his contract with Prodigy. It's a very interesting disc. I'll say I'm trying to be nice here. So let's go ahead and let's get into it. The reverb is a 13 speed. Yes. 13 speed, five glide, zero turn, three and a half fade, basically four fade. This disc <laughs> is so overstable. Now it does feel great for backhand and forehand, even as a little dome, a little pop top, which normally would not feel great for forehand, but because the rim of this disc is so wide, it doesn't quite feel that domey when I go to hold it for the forehand. But here, just take a listen to this pop top real quick. Isn't that insane? So this thing definitely has a dome, but it's not like a crazy unnatural dome that it would feel uncomfortable. Um, like I said, for the forehand, because the rim is a 13 speed rim, um, it doesn't quite bother the forehand grip that much because the dome isn't very close to your thumb when you're going for the forehand grip. But so that's a good thing. Um, this plastic, this 400 plastic is definitely grippy and it's not all that slick. 
uh, in, in a good way. I mean, obviously it's a slicker plastic, like it's not tacky or anything like that. Uh, or grainy like that. I think it's the 500 plastic that's a little grainy. Um, but basically, nice and clear, almost uh, like champion style. And it just feels really good. Like the plastic definitely feels great. But this disc, remember it's zero turn, three and a half or four fade, whatever you want to call it, is stupid overstable for the average disc golfer. Like it is so fast and so overstable, the average disc golfer has no reason <laughs> to be throwing this disc. Is that five glide accurate? Yes. I will say this disc does glide. Um, my best throws with it were spike hyzers, and I really saw, ironically enough, I really saw the glide in the spike hyzer because uh, it just kept carrying. And truthfully, that were that was some of my longest throws with this disc, throwing a spike hyzer because I was just able to let the disc do the work and not try to fight the disc. I found this disc to be way too fast for me and way too overstable. I mean, every year companies are coming out with more and more overstable discs. And earlier this year, Innova came out with the Juggernaut, which is like a 12 or 13 speed, four glide, one positive one turn and four fade. So just absolute meat hooks. Um, they're coming out with more and more. This one is probably not as overstable as the Juggernaut, but regardless, it's still an overstable disc. Now, the average disc golfer, and I do consider you know myself the average disc golfer, there's no reason for me to be throwing this disc. Like I will not be bagging this disc. Uh, it was fun to throw, but it is just way too much disc for me. And side note here, there's nothing wrong with admitting that. Like, there are just some discs that a player does not need to throw. And a high speed overstable driver is not a, is a disc that I do not need to be throwing. So I don't want you to feel any shame in saying like, hey, that's a disc I shouldn't be throwing at any speed. Like there are some putters and whatever out there that may be too overstable for you for what you need. And there's no reason to, you know, there's no shame in saying like, oh, I can't throw that disc or I shouldn't be throwing that disc. And there's a couple of reasons for that in the slower speed range, but especially as you get in the higher speed ranges, like if you start touching some 9, 10, 12, 13, even some 14 speed discs that exist out there, like it's okay to say, I'm not throwing that. Like I don't have any real distance drivers in my bag. I just don't. I pretty much have I have a ton of putters and mids and then I have like two or three fairway drivers and that's it. And my, and I love it. I love it because I can throw everything in my bag, backhand and forehand and get good distance and accuracy with it. So yeah, this disc is definitely not making my bag. Now, obviously I am the average disc golfer, I would say, um, you know, I have some strengths maybe that are better than the average disc golfer, but that being said, there are some of you maybe listening and people out there for sure who can throw this disc. I mean, obviously Kevin Jones can throw this disc. Um, so if you think you might be falling into that group, I would say that if you can throw fairways consistently a minimum of 375, like kind of your like sawed off or quasi bad throw with a fairway finishes at 375, 380, which means you're probably averaging closer to like 400 with the fairway. And then your distance drivers, let's say they go 450 plus. I would say that you probably can throw this disc. It would just be more a matter of whether or not you like it. Uh, because to reach that kind of distance and consistency and accuracy, like you do have power, you do have probably good form at that to be reaching that and not that you can't have good form and throw less than that but just it's it's hard to throw 450 feet if you don't even at least have semi-decent form um and some people just ha naturally have more power and maybe their sport background that kind of thing so if you fall into that window of distance i'm not going to say rating but if you fall into that window of distance this disc can probably work for you as a nice high-speed overstable driver, a good headwind driver, for sure. I mean, I threw this thing on Anheuser and it would fight out so fast. Like, it just would not stay on Anheuser uh, for me. 
someone else could probably get it. I mean, I felt so silly throwing this disc. I was happy if I got like 250 with it. And I got more than 250 when throwing spike hyzers, believe it or not. But that's mainly because I was like, okay, I'm just throwing this as high up in the air as I possibly can. And I'm just gonna let the disc do the work. But when trying to throw it flat, backhand or forehand, with even with Anheuser, it was like pushing it to get it because it would just fade so quickly. And since I wasn't getting it up to speed, like I don't have a 13 speed arm, I wasn't getting it up to speed. So I wasn't able to experience the full flight of the disc, which I mean, the full flight of this disc is straight and then left for, for right hand backhand or for right hand forehand, it's straight and then right. So it dumps pretty quick once it starts to slow down. But it's really good for skips, obviously, doing that. Now, I will say this. If you're thinking, okay, I can't throw that, but it sounds really good for those skip shots or, you know, for flex lines, you can try it. I'm not going to discourage you from trying it, but I will say that you would probably have better success finding a 9 to 12 speed disc that maybe has a little bit more forgiveness in its uh, flight characteristics, like maybe a little bit more turn. Uh, this has good glide, so I can't say more glide, but a little bit more turn, a little less fade, and you could probably get a better flight and still get the same results with skip shots and flex lines and that kind of thing. But that's basically it. Like I said, I felt silly throwing this thing, but it was I was so appreciative that OTB sent it to me. So if you want to go ahead and try out the Prodigy Disc Reverb, go ahead and head to otbdiscs.com and use my discount code for free shipping. I talked with OTB over the weekend and they are going to be trans, uh, transitioning some discount codes over to otbeast.com and they did say that my code will be working there as well. So I haven't checked actually to see if it's active yet, but it will be active at some point on otbeast.com. So if you're on the East Coast and you wanna check out OTB's second store, uh, which is such a cool thing, you can go ahead and check it out there, see if they have them in stock. If not, they're definitely in stock on OTB's main website. So that's all I have for the disc review. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, I couldn't really think of anything that current events. Valerie Mandahano is coming back for the DDO. Paul did win uh, his first uh, Europe uh, tournament um, this year. Not his first one ever, but th this year he did win. Uh, so that was really cool. I didn't get to watch any coverage of that, but happy for him. He seemed to be playing really well based on his scores. Like I said, I didn't get to watch it, but I want to transition to recapping the Zoo Town Open. As you guys can tell, this, this episode is probably gonna be a little bit shorter and that is okay. I'm really excited to talk about the Zoo Town Open. So, like I said in last week's episode, I've never played uh, in Missoula, Montana. Matt has played in Missoula. He hasn't played the Blue Ridge course. He played the other two courses when he was there. Um, but obviously, you know, elevation is the big thing here and this, this tournament is just so cool, so fun to watch. I love the elevation. Um, it was just incredible seeing so many holes that were like minimum 500, 550 feet and par threes, and then being actually like fair gettable par threes for the pros. Um, that was definitely something like pretty shocking, seeing like, hey, a 620 foot hole par three, but it's downhill like 80 feet. So it probably plays more like a 400, 440 foot hole, but there are so many big trees in the fairway that you really gotta still hit your line. And that's what I loved about this. Like this wasn't, this wasn't easy golf. It was different golf. You know what I mean? Like you had the elevation and you had obstacles in the way that if you miss your line, you were punished but the course wasn't so unforgiving and also the pars seemed to be really fair from what I was able to see for both MPO and FPO. And so that was really, really cool. Um, obviously with the elevation, the cameras did not do it justice. Uh, I was talking with Matt a little bit about it. He's like, yeah, those, those holes are so much steeper than they look on camera. And for example, I believe, yes, it was round two because 
Eh, side note, I know how it all ends. I know who wins, but I haven't finished watching the final round coverage. I've finished both MPO and FPO rounds one and two, but I'm actively working through final round coverage. But in round two, James Conrad, oh, I've, I, I don't remember the whole number, but there's a big downhill hole and there's like this window that you have to hit to just pure it to the basket. And when and James went first off the tee and when he threw, that disc was so low and it seemed so close to the ground, but it was perfect. And like that 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 clip, I just want to like replay over and over because that is the perfect um physical representation of throwing with elevation, like we talked about in episode four, that I could give anyone matching the grade of the hill. Now, some of the throws on that course, you didn't have to match the grade of the hill to reach the basket. You could throw some hyzers kind of over the trees or flat to hyzer. But this particular hole, you needed to throw down the hill. And the three players after him all threw low, but not low enough. And they might have gotten some good kicks, good kicks here or there. But definitely James had the best play. He threw so far down. Uh, it, ju- it seemed too low, which is ju- which just shows you how steep those hills really are. And so that was really cool to see. I really enjoyed watching them play. Can't wait to see the final round coverage and working through that. Now, you might be thinking, like I mentioned, we talked about how to throw with elevation in episode four. But one thing I didn't talk about is kind of like why elevation is so challenging in the sense of like what makes it different, Uh, like the science side of it. So I wanted to touch on that just really quick. So I looked at this up just to make sure I was, you know, telling you guys the truth here. So there's a reason why elevation is so tough. Obviously, as you get higher altitude, okay, the inverse for air density. So what that means is higher altitude, lower air density, lower air pressure. And so the way that affects a disc specifically is that as a disc is flying, it has less pressure underneath it to keep it up in the air. So something I remember in science class is like technically everything around us has air pressure pushing down on it, up under it, and on the sides. And that's why nothing just collapses under air pressure. But at those higher altitudes, there's less air pressure under the disc. And so the disc isn't flying necessarily different than the disc uh, should fly. But we as throwers are having just acclimated to how it's going to behave at higher altitudes. It's doing what the disc will do. And so that's why you see the disc fade out quicker. So at higher altitudes, a disc behaves, quote unquote, more overstable. So that's why you wanna throw more understable discs at higher altitudes, because you'll get more turn. And so the characteristics of the flight are going to work better in your favor. Now, this is why players from high altitude areas can throw so good. Like, and and I don't just mean like good as in like general, but like can throw so powerful. For example, Eagle is, I believe, from Denver or Boulder, Colorado. Um, He grew up in Colorado, high altitude. And it's just crazy. Like when he was, especially during uh, the COVID shutdown, I think when he was in Colorado throwing, making videos and just watching him throw like these cloud breakers and even the tilts and just getting so much flight out of them. And when you realize that he is 5,000, 3,000 foot elevation, absolutely insane. So in Missoula, Montana, they had about 3,000, 3,300 feet of elevation. So for the players, they knew theoretically how their disc was going to behave. But for some of them, um, with the long drive and everything, they didn't get in town on time to really test their discs and figure out how exactly they were going to fly. And so I know someone like Garrett Gerthy got in late and he didn't have enough, a ton of practice time to really get comfortable with how everything was flying, which is why he struggled round one. Um, but I hope that that all makes sense with the air pressure. So basically higher altitude, lower air density, lower air pressure, which means that the disc is not going to stay up long enough. I'm trying not to get into the weeds also because I am not, um, I don't have a major in aerodynamics or physics or anything like that. 
but based on what I was able to read and kind of learn about this, that is my basic understanding. I'm sure there are finer details to that, but I just wanted to share that with you. So the next time you're playing golf somewhere and you're at high altitude and things are flying more overstable, now you know why. Inversely, if you're somewhere that has high altitude and you go to play somewhere at a lower altitude, your discs are going to fly more understable than what you're used to. And once again, the disc is just doing what the disc is gonna do, but the way we perceive its flight is going to be different, which I think is just really, really cool. But overall, Missoula, Montana, the Zoo Town Open, I really enjoyed this tournament. It's so much fun, so pretty, the Blue Ridge Mountains in the background. It was well done, the, the holes, the pars, the distances, the obstacles, everything seemed fair. It's a gorgeous course. And I definitely want to play this course at some point. But that is all I have for the Zoo Town Open. Let's go ahead and let's look at the results. So in first place, we had Evan Scott at minus 23. That was the other really cool thing here. We got to see so many players in the top 10 um, or really just the top eight since there were quite a few ties that you may not be super familiar with some of them, but that was. But there were a lot of players in this tournament that we would recognize if you've been following the Pro Tour for the last year or two. But it was cool to see some other names that maybe are more up and coming, or there are some you know vets that just don't tour as much, and so that's really cool. Um, but Evan Scott minus twenty three in three rounds. That's how tough this course is. Like shooting seven to eight under par on average was going to win like yes the course seemed easy in this sense because like oh it's super downhill 500 feet par three so i only have to throw it like 400 or 350 whatever depending on the elevation but tough course big trees big big trees so evan scott first place minus 23 second place clay edwards minus 19 so we had a four stroke victory tied for third anthony barella and ty love at minus 18 Tied for fifth, James Conrad and Dallin Blanchard at minus 17. Also, this course, uh, Zoo Town, basically, this is where James played disc golf for the first time. Military family. I know Nate Perkins talks a lot about this on uh, CCDG's coverage, but really cool that he was able to come back and play well, you know, finish tied for fifth at minus 17. Uh, seventh place, Jake Mon at minus 16. And then tied for eighth, we had five players, Nico LaCastro, Colton Montgomery, Ezra Robinson, Kevin Jones, and Gannon Burr at minus 15. And then we had 13th place was Casey Hanemeyer or Hainmeyer at minus 13. Um, so really cool there. And then in the FPO division, a uh, little bit closer at times than I think any of us were expecting. So in the FPO division, we had Kristen Tatar. She did win. She shot minus 26, but like I said, there were times where it was a little bit closer than I think a lot of us were expecting. In second place, Missy Gannon at minus 22, good for her. Third place, Katrina Allen at minus 21. Fourth place, Sarah Hokum at minus 19. Sarah Hokum did the uh, FPO coverage with Nate Perkins. She's won this event four times in the past. So that is awesome. So she definitely knows this course well. Fifth place, Stacey Haas at minus 16. Sixth place, Stacey Ronsley at minus 13. Seventh place, Sai Ananda at minus 12. Sai was keeping pace, but round two, she fell a little bit off the off the pace behind Kristen, and then round three, she was also off pace. Uh, so she finished 14 strokes behind Kristen, where at one point she was three strokes separating her and Kristen. Um, honestly, Sai has been such a good story this year, and has been such a bright spot in the FPO field. I'm not worried about like, you know, I would not be worried about her play. I think. This was just one of those tournaments where she didn't perform as well in the big picture. She had some really good throws, some really good putts and performances on certain holes. But overall, she just struggled a little bit, and that's okay. Uh, I know I would struggle on this course too. Uh, eighth place, Holly Finley at minus 11. Ninth place, we had a tie with Juliana Korber and Erica Stinchcomb at minus 10. Erica Stinchcomb, really cool, is a Montana native. So this was kind of like her... 
uh, home home tournament, home course. Um, not sure that she played in Missoula a lot, but as a Montana native, that was probably really cool for her to play there and to shoot well. Minus 10. That is awesome. I have the round ratings pulled up. So minus 10 means uh, that round one, Erica shot a 951 rated round, followed that up with a 969 rated round, and then ended with a 914 rated round. So a lot of players shot worse on day three. And I have a couple of theories for that. Not everyone shot worse on day three, but fatigue and just, uh, you know, the elevation getting to the disc, you know, obviously you've kind of figured things out, but there's not a course on tour that's probably more mountainous and has more elevation than Missoula than Zootown Open did. So I'm sure by day three, there was a lot of exhaustion coming into play because those holes are still long holes. Like, yes, it might be a downhill 400, 500 foot hole, but you still have to throw the disc right and throw it well to get it there. So good for her. Um, glad she played well, but just to put that into perspective, ninth place probably averaged like a 945 you know, for the weekend. Um, that's that's really good shooting. So let's go ahead and let's now pivot to the upcoming tournament. I hope you're excited because I'm super excited. We have the Dynamic Discs open this weekend. We know this course. It's a love-hate relationship for a lot of people. It's a love relationship when there's no wind on the rare occasion. And it's a hate relationship when it is so windy. But it's probably going to be windy. It's an open course. There's a lot of OB. Um, yeah, if you want to know what it's like to play this course, by the way, you should check out Disc Golf Valley. No, they're not a sponsor, but I've been playing a lot over the last several months. I just love that game so much. And you can play the, uh, the layout there. And it is crazy just how it's, you know, we look at it on coverage like, oh, man, yeah, that's tough. I wonder how I would fare. And then when you go and play it in Disc Golf Valley, you're like, oh yeah, this is actually really tough. Like they do a really good job of mirroring the effects of that course and just really, you know, the tight OBs and how you have to be really particular with your landing zones and where you're ending up. So obviously a video game is very different than real life. For example, Ricky won last year, won the entire event. The entire three rounds, Ricky won with a score of minus 10. That means he averaged between three and four strokes under par per round. That's how tough this course can play. Chris and Tatar won shooting even. This course was so tough last year because of the wind. The and obviously the OB and the length of the course are always going to be the same like that. They may they've made adjustments over the years, but it's really the wind that beats up these players and then obviously OB. So the name of the game with DDO is definitely staying out of OB as much as possible. I don't think anyone's able to avoid it, but if you can stay out of it more than your competition, that's obviously gonna fare pretty well for you any weekend, but especially at DDO. So the next thing I wanna do is let's go ahead and Let's make our grip six picks. I'm super excited about this. Uh, let me get my phone. Okay, so for grip six, we gotta keep in mind a couple things here. We got wind, we got a lot of players, but we also got some players who may not be there. Oh no, are they not available yet? No. You know, this is kind of what happens when I do my, uh, like, I, I, I normally record on Tuesday nights, you know, and I don't ever feel like Tuesday night is all that early, but apparently it is. So to make up for that, we'll go ahead. I just kind of want to run through last year's results to kind of give everybody some perspective real quick. So like I said, Ricky won shooting minus 10. Simon finished in second at minus four. So the realistic score here was minus four because Third place was minus two with Vino Makala, Aaron Gossage, Logan Harpool, Jason Hebenheimer, and Brody Smith. So the fact that that Ricky shot minus 10 is just absolutely insane because we then have minus one in eighth place with Chris Dickerson and GT Hancock. And then 10th place, 
Calvin Heimberg, James Conrad, Gannon Burr, they shot even. I mean, when was the last time those players shot even and finished tied for 10th on the Disc Golf Pro Tour? Like, that is just insane, um, the kind of conditions that they were playing. You had so many players, places, let's see, from 13th place all the way to the very bottom, uh, which of scores that were kept was 106. They fit that that was all over par and 106 finish plus 44. And there were several players who did not finish the tournament. There were, wow, 10 players, 10 or 12 players that did not finish, um, which is just crazy. FPO side, Kristen, nobody went under par. Like I said, Kristen shot even in one. We had one over with Katrina Allen. And then third place was eight over with Ella Hansen and Emily Beach. And that is so good when you consider the conditions. Um, Let me see something here. Yeah, so shooting eight over for the weekend. (laughs) Eight over for the weekend. This is for Ella specifically. She shot a 919 rated round, round one. Obviously not very good. 957 rated second round. And then the final round of the day, or excuse me, the third round was 1007, so 1007. And then the fourth round was 987. She shot all over 900. One round was over 1,000 rated. She shot plus eight. Kristen's had a 939 rated first round, 1020 second round, 990 third round, 981 final round, and she shot even. Like that is just wild to me because that is just how difficult the conditions were. Um, in the MPO division, they were all you had to shoot thousand rated rounds every round to basically finish. Let's see what's looking like. Yeah, basically to finish like in the top twenty, kind of even top twenty five, you had to shoot over a thousand rated every single round. Uh, which is just so crazy to think about that course. But anyway, I can't do my grip six picks because they're not available yet. But I just kind of want to look at who's playing this weekend and just kind of pick out a couple names that I think could perform really well. And if you guys don't follow me on Instagram or you don't or you haven't joined my Discord server yet, you definitely want to do that so that you can see who I'm going to pick for my grip six picks. I share them there every week. I talk with everyone on Discord. It's a lot of fun. Links will be in the description. Uh, for discord if you want to join the server there we have a blast we trade discs we talk about disc golf we help each other out with tips it's always a lot of fun so for mpo honestly i'll be really excited to keep an eye on nico lacasho he loves overstable discs and uh, i'd be really excited to see how he plays this course also with that being said joel freeman we haven't seen him a lot as much this season on lead cards like we did last year but he's got some power he loves throwing overstable discs especially in the wind playing some flex lines hopefully we can see him perform really well i'd love to see garrett girthy make a comeback he kind of faltered this past weekend at zoo town but i think he could have a good showing this weekend in at ddo i definitely think ricky is coming with vengeance to defend his title Not because, like, obviously he won last year, but just, you know, he's missed a lot this year, but he's still performed well when he has played. I think it'd be really cool to see him get a back-to-back victory with that. Um, Kevin Jones played well this past weekend, and it'd be really nice to see him kind of step it up and really, you know, maybe compete for the victory or at least be on the lead card uh, at least one round this year or this weekend. So that would be cool. So that is the MPO division. There are a lot of players. I can't go through the entire list, but it's going to be windy. I would imagine. So it'll be really interesting to see how everything plays out on the FPO side. Let me see here. Uh, okay. There's Kristen. So, um, obviously everyone's going to be expecting Kristen to defend her title or at least to finish in the top three. And I am expecting that as well. Now, one thing I will say is we do just need to keep in mind that a lot can happen at DDO. Nothing is a given. I'm excited to see Valerie Mandahano come back and play. I really want to see her do well. But this is a tough tournament. 
to come back and play for the first time after a couple months off, basically. Uh, Evelina Solonen is playing. It'd be great to see her. Uh, she has great power, great control. Hopefully, she's worked on that putt over the last couple of months. Haven't seen her a whole lot on coverage. Hopefully, she's been working on those things. And then Katrina Allen has been hovering in the top five, top ten, but we haven't really seen her... Um, get any bit you know get a ton of victories this year she was playing really well last year and the year before that so it'd be cool to kind of see her pick up the pace a little bit and i don't see i see page shoe but let me do a quick scan here for page pierce okay let me do a find because i'm not seeing <sighs> page pierce is not playing ddo okay I was not expecting that. I was expecting her to play. Okay. Well, that's kind of a bummer because I would have loved to see Paige Pierce play DDO, but she's not. That's okay. Well, that's all I have for you today, guys. Hope you really enjoyed this episode. We did uh, we did a few things a little differently this week with you know no group six picks because they're not available yet. We didn't really talk about many current events, but I hope you learned something with the disc golf tip. Remember, pop your fingers on those putts and you'll get a lot better distance and pace on your putts, especially from distance and with low ceiling. Work on that pop. Um, definitely check out the reverb if you have the arm for it and you're really wanting that nice overstable high speed driver. If you just want something really goofy to throw because you just don't have the ability to throw it, you could also check it out at otbdiscs.com. Thank you so much for listening, guys. I want to encourage you to spend this week or weekend teaching someone to play disc golf. Encourage someone who's maybe having a tough time with the game. Give them some support. Give them some fun, friendly tips. Share this podcast with them. That would mean the world to me. And uh, definitely please leave a review, by the way, as well, if you haven't already done so. I really appreciate that. And make sure that you also go out and play disc golf this week. Have fun. I, unfortunately, am not going to get to play. I'll be traveling all weekend. I won't be able to play. So go out there, play around for me, message me on Discord, share your scores. Can't wait to hear from you guys. So until next time, everybody, have a great round.